Well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name's Duncan. It's wonderful to see you this evening. If I say morning in my sermon, then it's because I'm used to preaching <laughs> in the morning. But before I do preach, I would just like to uh, read to you our, our next reading, which is from Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 15. This is the story of the wise men. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Now when they had departed, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Every year. Christians come together at this kind of time and reflect on the Christmas story. Now, the Christmas story is the story of God becoming a man. That's an extraordinary story, isn't it? The story of God being born in human flesh. Jesus, the eternal, everlasting God, God the Son who has existed eternally, being born in human flesh, coming to the earth as a baby child. If this story is true, it should change your life. If this story is true, it means that we can know what God is like. If God created the world and then disappeared and did not, had nothing to do with the world which he had created, then my job would be to stand up here and to guess and just to describe guesses of what I think God might be like. But that's not what God did. He created the world and he cared for it, so much so he sent his son into the world and he reveals what God in heaven is like. If this Christmas story is true, it means that God cares about humanity. It means that he cares about you. If the Christmas story is true, it means that life has a purpose and a meaning to it. Life isn't just meaningless and we can do whatever we want. And it's, no, it means that God has a purpose for us if the Christmas story is true. And if the Christmas story is true, it also means there is comfort, hope and joy, even through dark and difficult times. And that's really what I want to show you this evening from the Christmas story, that there is comfort, there is hope and there is joy for you in this story that we've heard read from the Bible. Now, given all of that, before I even begin, Every single one of you should want the Christmas story to be true. Do you want it to be true? You should, if all these things are true, we can know God and he cares about us and there's meaning in life. All of, us, all of us should be going, whether we're Christians or not, I really hope this is true. And so if you're in that place, if you're hoping that this is true, would you do something for me? In a moment, I'm going to pray. But when I pray, can I encourage you to pray your own prayer in your heart and just say this, God, if you're there, would you reveal yourself to me? Pray that prayer as I pray a similar thing with my words from the front. Is that okay? So let's pray together. Heavenly Father, if you are there, in fact, if you are here with us, would you move in this place and speak to every single one of us? 
Would you reveal yourself and bring comfort and hope and joy into our lives, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to show you three things from the Christmas story that has been read to us so far this evening. And part one of the Christmas story I want to show you is darkness. There's angels and there's stars and there's wise men and there's shepherds and there's glory and there's joy and we've had pretty lights and carols and dances from the front. But did you notice the darkness in the story of Christmas? Did you notice the darkness? In the first reading we had, there was the shame of Mary getting pregnant before she had married Joseph. And there was the kind of this moment where Joseph's going, I'm going to just divorce her quietly. I'm going to, I'm going to just break up quietly so no one will notice so it won't shame Mary. But there's that moment of shame. And although the angel appears to Joseph in a dream and family breakdown is avoided in this instance, shame and broken families is a huge darkness in this world. And it can be a challenge, particularly at this time of year, for many, many people. In the second reading, there was a Roman census. And because there was a census, Mary and Joseph have to go to Bethlehem. Now, you might think, well, that's not dark. Why is that dark? No, actually, that is terrible news, because why is there a Roman census? It's because the Roman Empire have invaded Israel. The Israelite people are under foreign rule and they have to submit to the authority who have come into this land. They have to go, OK, well, if you say so, even though you don't be you don't belong here, this isn't your land. This is this. Is, we're Israel. We're, this isn't Rome. And yet we have to submit to your rule. So in the second reading, it sounds really nice as a census and they went to Bethlehem. But actually, that story is full of darkness. And in my reading about the wise men, do you know I stopped? just before I got to the really, really dark bit. Churches have a habit of doing this at Christmas. We read the nice verses that everyone loves and sometimes miss out the more difficult verses. I read to you Matthew 2, 1 to 15. Let me read to you what happens in verse 16. Probably the darkest moment in the whole Christmas story. Matthew 2, verse 16 says, Then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise man, became furious. And he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under, according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. Isn't that just horrifically dark in the Christmas story? This story of King Herod killing all these children. A king so desperate to cling to power, so threatened that another king had been born that he seeks to murder children. If you read history, by the way, you'll see that it is horrifyingly common for children to get murdered by leaders who get threatened and want to cling to power. It happens all the time if you read history. In our world today, many innocent civilians will be killed as leaders fight for the power that they want to cling on to. You know, it's part of me that when I wrote this talk thought, don't talk about the darkness, Duncan, just talk about the cheerful bits. Let's talk about the nice, bright, shining lights. Let's be really happy this Christmas time. But those parts of the story are the reality of the Christmas story in the Bible. And the truth is they're, a, they're reality for us during Christmas periods. So anyway, as part of my job, I meet with people and just talk about their lives. And so often, actually, as Christmas approaches, pain in people's lives is amplified and darkness seems to increase. Even though there's lots of nice things going on and people aren't falling apart with misery, there's also extreme pain and darkness in our lives at this time. Christ is described as a light who enters into a world full of darkness. And if you've got your cards, the first verse on your card is John 1 verse 5. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. Darkness can take many forms, can't it? I'm willing to bet every single one of us in this room knows something of the darkness of our world. Perhaps you're focused on the wars that are happening in the world right now. Maybe you're struggling with grief at a loved one who won't be here this year. Maybe you struggle with shame. I wonder how many people will read a Christmas letter or go on social media and say, wow, that person's doing amazing. Their life looks awesome. If only my life was like that. I'm so ashamed of what I'm doing in life. Many of us will experience family arguments, perhaps even suffer the pain of families that have broken apart. Other people will struggle with loneliness over Christmas. 
and some will struggle with guilt. It was me who ruined Christmas last year, or it's me who's messed this up. There's all kinds of darkness in this world. If you can relate to any of that, if you're going, yeah, I, I, please stop talking about it, Duncan, but you're right, there is darkness in the world, it's worth asking this question. Why is it that Jesus came to such a dark world? Why is it that he chose this moment in history to enter into the world? Why did he come to an invaded country, to a poor family who ended up as a refugee in Egypt because of what King Herod was doing? Why did he make that decision? He could have come at any moment in history and he chose this darkness to enter into. Well, the answer is that Jesus came on a mission to deal with darkness, to offer light and joy and hope even salvation. And that will be my next point. We'll think about the salvation mission of Jesus. But before I get there, if you know darkness in your own life right right now, I want you to be comforted. Jesus, God the Son, who was prepared to enter the world 2,000 years ago, was prepared to enter that darkness then, is also prepared to enter your darkness now. He's also prepared, in fact, he's more than prepared. He's willing, he wants to come to you and enter into the darkness and pain and struggles of your life in order to bring you that light and hope and comfort. So take comfort. We all struggle with different things, but take heart. Christ wants to come into your darkness and shine his light in your life. So the first part is darkness. But the second part of the Christmas story is Christ's salvation mission. Jesus comes, he's born, he enters into this dark, dark world on a mission. And Jesus' mission is described in Matthew 1 verse 21, where, where the angel is speaking to Joseph in a dream. And the angel says to Joseph, Mary will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save people from their sins. Did you know the name Jesus literally means the Lord saves, God saves, that's his very name. He comes into the world to save us. So he comes into this dark world in order to rescue us. And Matthew 1.21 says that Jesus rescues us from our sins. You see, all the darkness in this world is caused by human beings doing wrong things. Greed causes war. Selfishness causes others to be lonely. Pride causes shame. And doing wrong causes guilt in our lives. And and here's the challenge. Here's the challenge when we think about dark things. It's easy to see darkness out there. It's easy to look at others and go, oh, that person's quite proud and selfish. Or that country has messed up the world. That political leader is horrendous. It's easy to see darkness out there. But it's harder to see darkness in here. Do you have the honesty this evening to say, actually, I'm in some way part of the darkness. I'm in some way have contributed to the darkness. Think about your worst deed, just for a moment. Think about your worst thought, the thing you've never said out loud. If you're anything like me, there's darkness in here as well. Not just out there in the world, but there's darkness in here as well. And the Bible calls that sin. The Bible says that sin includes deeds that we do, thoughts and deeds. It also includes the things that the good things that we should have done that we didn't do. But here's where the Christmas story becomes really, really good news. It sounds like bad news so far, doesn't it? I'm sorry about that. But here's where the Christmas story becomes really, really good news. Jesus comes to save us from our sins. That's why John 1.5 says the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The Christmas story is the Christmas story of light beating darkness. Light shining and darkness retreated, retreats as it always does. If you look behind you for a moment, you can see that it's dark outside. There's no light, but in here, light has conquered. Light has won and darkness has gone. This is how Jesus, the light, conquers darkness. This is how Jesus saves you from your sins if you believe in him. In his life, Jesus was blameless, perfect, kind, caring. He spoke truth always. He challenged injustice around him. In fact, the Bible says God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. And Jesus was God in the world. So in Jesus' life, he was just light. There was no darkness in him at all. He was perfect in everything he did. 
But in Jesus' death, something wonderful and extraordinary happens. Suppose that this red present over here is Jesus Christ. And this white paper represents his light, his perfection. It's perfectly white. And suppose this green present over here is you or me. And this black paper, they kind of look like coals, right? Imagine this black paper represents our darkness, our sin in our lives. So you've got Christ over here, perfect and blameless, and you've got us over here with our darkness. On the cross, here's what Jesus does. He offers himself as a substitute. He says, here's the greatest swap deal you will ever hear offered to you. Here's what I'm going to do. Let me give you my lightness, my light, my righteousness. And I will take your darkness and your sin. Christ carries our darkness and our sin upon the cross. And that means that Jesus died a sinner's death. He carried our guilt and our shame and our selfishness and our, pr our pride and our greed. He dies a sinner's death upon the cross. And we are free to live as sons and daughters of God. Jesus was God the Son and he gave to us his light, his brightness as being children of God. He didn't just die on the cross and take away our sin and darkness though. He also breathes on Christians and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God himself as well. The Holy Spirit comes and he enters into Christian lives and he begins to transform us from the inside out. So we don't just receive a clean record from Christ. We also receive help on the inside from the Holy Spirit to transform our lives. And then Christ did not remain in the grave, but he rose again from the dead. So here's what Jesus offers to you this Christmas time. Here's the greatest present you could receive this Christmas. A clean record from Jesus. Guiltless, blameless. Inner transformation by the Holy Spirit. And everlasting life. He who, raised, who was raised from the dead says to all who believe in him, you will have everlasting life if you believe in me. You, you have to receive that gift though. You receive it by faith. By believing in Jesus, believing in his life, death and resurrection and trusting him. I'll lead us in a prayer in a moment, which will be a prayer of trust, a prayer of putting your faith in Jesus. So that's Jesus's rescue mission coming to save us from our sins. But I want to bring one third and final part in the Christmas story. And that's from Matthew 2 verses 10 to 11, and it's what I read to you from the wise men story. Let me read to you, this to you again. When the wise men saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy, and going into the house, they saw the child with Mary his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. When you realise who Jesus is, that he is God, come in human flesh, come to rescue us from our sin, and you put your faith in him, you trust him and believe in him for that, two things happen. Firstly, you rejoice with exceedingly great joy. The world needs this joy. This is the joy of the Christian heart, that Jesus is a saviour, a king, a God, who died for you, who rose again, who defeated death, who gave you the spirit transforming your life. And so to believe in him is to receive joy. And the wise men get it. They receive exceedingly great joy. I think that Matthew writing this story kind of runs out, with, runs out of words. It says they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. It's just joy, 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 joy. The wise men were probably dancing down the streets as they came to the stable to visit Jesus Christ. And that's the joy of Christian lives transformed. This is the joy of having Jesus as a saviour. I tell you the truth, my greatest joy in life, and it's not close, my greatest joy in life is knowing Jesus and receiving this glorious salvation. And the reason we do all this, the reason we've been here putting up lights and decorations, the reason we're going to serve you some great mulled wine and mince pies afterwards, the reason we're here is because we want you to know that joy. We want you to rejoice exceedingly with great joy and know the joy of knowing Jesus, your saviour, forever and ever. That's what happens when you believe in Christ. You know that kid at the beginning who was the third doorkeeper and was so excited in the nativity story? 
Do you know there's a verse in the Bible that says, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than dwell in the tents of wickedness. I'd rather be doorkeeper three in Jesus's house. And I would be like that kid and go, I'm doorkeeper three in the house of the Lord. Jesus is my saviour. He's rescued me. I'd rather be there than outside of God's kingdom. I'd rather be with Jesus forever than not with Jesus in the tents of wickedness. I love that kid. He's so, he's so enthusiastic. I just love that video. Let's be doorkeeper threes in the house of God and be filled with the joy of these wise men. So that's the first thing. When you believe in Christ, you, you receive this glorious joy. But there's a second thing that happens as well. You worship him. The wise men fall down and offer him their gifts. This baby. They're so wise. They've got it. Even though this is Jesus, this is God in baby form, they're going, this is God. I need to worship him. I need to bow down before him. I'm going to give him gold, frankincense. I'm going to give my very best gift. And that's what being a Christian is. It's with exceedingly great joy coming before Jesus and saying, here I am. You're my God. I want to praise you. I want to worship you. I want to adore you. I want to surrender to you. I want to give you all my best gifts. And there's joy in that place of worship. There's joy in worshipping King Jesus. So here's the good news of the Christmas story. God cares enough about humanity. God cares enough about you to come to earth. He came to save you, to give you a clean record, to give you inner transformation, to give you eternal life, to give you exceedingly great joy and to give you a God to worship and a purpose in life to bring him glory. And one day, all the darkness in the world will be eradicated. Christ will return and Christians and believers will live in light forever with him. I want you to receive that wonderful, wonderful gift. And if you want to receive it, I'm going to lead us in a prayer. Just say amen in your heart. The word amen just means truly or I agree. So if you say amen in your heart, you're saying, yeah, what Duncan prayed, I want to make that my prayer. Why don't we bow our heads and let's just pray to God. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came to earth. You care about us. You were born in human flesh on a rescue mission to save us from our sins. Thank you that you were born in order that you might one day die for us, in order that this great swap might be offered to us. And Lord, I want to say that I receive that gift from you. I believe in you, Jesus. I believe that you lived and died and rose again. I believe that you've taken my sin, my darkness away, and I've received your light, your being a son of God. I enter into that relationship now. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for me. Would you fill me with that exceedingly great joy that the wise man had? had? And may I worship you, offering you everything that I am. Lord Jesus, we love you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.